from the gentlest trickle of melting ice to the fiery fury of molten rock. What makes one substance melt at a whisper of warmth while another needs the heat of a volcano? The answer lies in the invisible forces that hold their particles together. Everything around us is made of particles, whether they are atoms, ions or molecules. They are pulled towards each other by forces that determine how strongly or how weakly they are held together. And it is these forces that control when, that is, at what temperature, a substance will change its state. In this programme, we will explore the different types of forces at play, whether they are the weak forces of attraction between simple molecules or the almost unbreakable networks of strong bonds between some of the hardest materials on Earth. So join us as we uncover the science of melting points and reveal how the strength of the forces between particles explains the difference between solids, liquids and gases and in what condition we will find substances at atmospheric temperature and pressure. This is the second episode looking at the AQA exam specification point on the states of matter and we're focusing on those last two parts. Why the particle model needs forces and what the different types of force are that play their part in the world around us. As I stand here in my garden, it is currently 10 degrees centigrade, which is a bit chilly for this sort of thing, so I am very glad I've got my coat on. However, I'm surrounded by substances in all three states of matter. This water in my glass is in its liquid state, the nitrogen and oxygen in the air around me are in the gas state, and the iron in this table is in the solid state. In fact, to turn that iron into its liquid state, I would need to warm it beyond 1538 degrees centigrade, a temperature at which the water in my glass would have long ago boiled away. Likewise, to find some liquid nitrogen, I would need to reduce the surrounding air temperature well below water's freezing point of zero degrees C, in fact, all the way down to minus 196 degrees C. So why have these substances got such different melting and boiling points? To answer that question, I'm going to need to uncover the hidden world of forces that are holding these particles together. Let's start with why we need to consider these forces at all. In my introduction to the particle model, I showed a beaker full of little plastic spheres as a model of a substance in the liquid state. It's not a bad model, but if I pour those particles out onto a flat surface, they roll in all directions, which is very different to pouring out some water. When we clearly see that the water stays together and forms a puddle. The reason for this is simple. These plastic spheres do not really have any forces between them. They simply bounce off each other and roll away. Water molecules are not like this. Each molecule is attracted to the ones around it. The force of attraction is actually quite strong. And if you want to feel that force, simply go for a swim. It's the strength of those forces that makes it difficult to push your arms through the water. It's also the reason a belly flop hurts so much. But please, don't try that one at the local pool. Within the GCSE chemistry course, we will consider three different types of attractive forces. Intermolecular forces, strong electrostatic forces between charged particles, and formal covalent bonds. 
I will say now that this gets very technical very quickly. But that's okay, because this is really just an overview. And I will look at each of these in much more detail in future videos. So this is either a good general primer for what is to come, or if you've already covered that content, then it's a great recap of the key points. So let's get going. The first and weakest of our forces is that that occurs between uncharged molecules. We call them intermolecular forces. That inter bit at the start just means between. Think of intercity trains going between cities or intercontinental flights traveling between continents. These intermolecular forces are generally pretty weak and it doesn't take much energy to overcome them. This is why small molecule substances like oxygen and nitrogen, chlorine, etc. tend to be gases with very low boiling points and even lower melting points. Now, let me be clear about what happens when these substances change from their liquid to their gas states. The spaces between the molecules increase but the molecules themselves stay intact. It's a bit like couples dancing in a ballroom. The spaces between the couples might change, but the dance partners are still holding hands. I'll come back to this later, so just hold on to that thought for now. Next, we come to those strong electrostatic forces. I'm sure you're familiar with this old trick of picking up bits of tissue paper with a balloon that's been rubbed on a shirt. You're probably aware that this effect is caused by a few extra electrons transferred onto the balloon, creating a small excess negative charge. It seems like a tiny force, but think about it for a moment. The gravitational field of the whole planet Earth is pulling those bits of tissue paper down onto the table, and only a few thousand electrons are pulling it up. So it's a stronger force than you think, particularly at the sort of distances that exist between particles. So, what if those particles themselves have a formal charge? For example, table salt is a chemical compound with the formula NaCl. It is actually an equal proportion of positive sodium ions and negative chloride ions. Their electrostatic attraction is a very strong force. In fact, if I wanted to melt some sodium chloride, I would have to heat it to something in excess of 801 degrees centigrade. A similar situation is found in metals where they're actually held together by the attraction between positive metal ions and their free moving outer electrons. Again, this explains why we generally find metals with relatively high melting points and therefore in the solid state at room temperature and pressure. Now, remember what I said about what happens when substances made of small molecules like water move from the liquid to the gas state. When water boils, its molecules move apart, but they stay as H2O the whole time. There are what we call covalent bonds between the atoms in such molecules, and they absolutely stay intact. It takes a huge amount of energy to break these bonds. So, what if a substance was made entirely out of those strong interlinked covalent bonds? It's actually not that common to find substances like this, but there is one you should certainly know about for the GCSE course. The element carbon has a few forms, and one of them is built out of a network of entirely strong 
bonds. In this material, each carbon atom is joined to four of its neighbours with these strong bonds to create a massive interlinked structure. We call these structures giant covalent structures and their substances have the highest of all melting points. If you're lucky, you might own a small piece of carbon in this giant covalent structure. We call it diamond. It has a melting point of around 4,000 degrees centigrade. And it is clear that those atoms must therefore be held very tightly together. It is these same forces, by the way, that give diamonds their famous hardness. Now, I haven't got a large diamond to show you because, for some reason, the local jewel shop wasn't willing to let me walk off with one for the afternoon. So you'll have to make do with this video clip of one. However, I would like to point out that if anybody wishes to send me a very large diamond, I promise to gratefully accept it. Here are some rules of thumb to help you to identify what type of structure and bonding you are looking at. These are guidelines only. There are exceptions to every rule. But, should an exam question come up on this topic, they certainly won't be looking to trip you up. And so, this section provides some useful guidelines. Small molecules are only attracted to each other by those weak intermolecular forces. And so they tend to have low or very low melting and boiling points. Most of these substances will melt long before zero degrees centigrade and will boil at less than 100 degrees centigrade. Metals and ionic compounds are both held together by strong electrostatic forces between their charged particles and so have higher melting and boiling points. Most will melt at a few hundred degrees centigrade and even the hardiest will melt by about 1500 degrees centigrade. Although we don't tend to consider the boiling points of these substances, it is fair to expect their boiling points to be over 1000 degrees centigrade. Finally, we come to the giant covalent structures. Those strong covalent bonds need lots of energy to break them, and so we expect very high melting points. Silicon dioxide, for example, melts at 1,713 degrees centigrade, and carbon well above 3,000 degrees centigrade in all of its allotropes. You are very unlikely to be asked about the boiling point of a giant covalent structure. But, if we look at carbon, we can see that in all of its allotropes, it turns into a gas above 3,500 degrees centigrade. What might an examiner ask us? Well, remember, this is tied up with some fairly deep chemistry, which we will get into in a future episode. But they will often ask questions like this. Explain, in terms of structure and bonding, why nitrogen has a low boiling point of minus 196 degrees centigrade. Now, our approach is always the same. First, identify the type of structure and bonding we are dealing with. In this case, it's small molecules. Then, identify the type of force holding the particles together and whether it is strong or weak. Here, it is weak intermolecular forces. Finally, link this information into whether the substances will need lots of energy to change state or not, and tie this into the transition temperature you were given in the question. Our final answer, therefore, looks something like this. Nitrogen is a small molecule with weak intermolecular forces between its individual molecules. It does not take much energy to overcome these forces, and so it has a low boiling point. Remember that low melting or boiling points mean that we have weak forces and therefore little energy is needed 
to overcome them. And likewise, if a substance has a high melting point or boiling point, then it will have strong forces between its particles and they will take a large amount of energy to overcome them. Let's look at how we can keep those groups of words together in exam answers. So, if we're talking about small molecules, you'll always mention weak intermolecular forces, the fact that it requires little energy to overcome them, and then that will lead to low melting and boiling points. If we're talking about metals and ionic compounds, we're going to be talking about their strong electrostatic forces between their particles, the large amounts of energy that are required to overcome them, and that therefore these substances will have high melting and boiling points. Giant covalent structures are of course going to involve very strong covalent bonds and therefore require very large amounts of energy to overcome those forces, leading to very high melting points. The other type of question might be a simple classification of substances into a structure, such as this. Here we can see there's some data on four substances. We need to decide which ones are likely to be made up of small, neutral molecules. And all we have to do is see which ones have the low boiling points. Can you spot them? Hopefully, you identified samples A and C. Now, which of the two that is left is likely to be a giant covalent structure? Yep, it's D. Well done if you spotted it. There's a lot more of these questions on the free worksheet, which is available on my Patreon page. So why not head over there at the end of this video and download it? You can work through it. An answer sheet is provided and that will really help you to remember the content. However, before you disappear, please take a moment to like and subscribe to the channel because that really helps me continue to make this sort of content and then in turn, I can help you with your exam prep. Thank you very much and see you next time.